Hello Year 10 and welcome to your third podcast on a poem and this time we're looking at Poppies by Jane Weir. Your first podcast was obviously Remains and then Bayonet Charges up on the website and this one is all about the poem Poppies. Now before we start it will be helpful, it would be helpful if you had a copy of the poetry work pack for summer too just because there are bits you can fill in and if you want to get hold of that you can either get a hard copy from school or it's up on the website as well. Don't worry if you haven't got it, you can just go through this video and take notes on line paper, that's just as good. Okay, so let's start with step one. As you know, when you start to learn a poem and revise a poem, the first thing you need to do is read all the context information and the writer's message and learn all about that. So let's do that now for poppies. So Jane Weir wrote the poem. She was born in 1963 and she grew up in Italy and in England. She also lived for a while in Northern Ireland during the time of the Troubles. So that was a time of conflict in Northern Ireland. So this means she has seen some conflict in her life. She's never been involved in a war, but she's seen a bit of conflict when she was living in Northern Ireland. Jane Way is also a textile designer as well as a poet. So when you read the poem, you should be able to find little references to sewing and to different materials. And that comes from her knowledge of textiles because she's a textile designer. She wrote this poem for a collection of poems that Carol Ann Duffy was putting together in 2009 for the Guardian newspaper. So as you know, before Simon Armitage, Carol Ann Duffy was our poet laureate. So what she did was she asked 10 different poem, poets to write a poem about war and she put them together and they went into the Guardian newspaper. And a lot of them would be poems about a soldier fighting in war and things like that. But Jane Weir's poem is a little bit different because it writes about war from a mother's perspective. So it would stand out in that way. It's a little bit of a different type of war poem, this, because it's all coming from a mother's perspective. Jane Weir had two sons, but neither of them have been to war. So what she had to do when writing this poem was imagine what it would feel like as a mother if one of your sons went to war. Because she'd had no first-hand experience of that. So she's put herself into that position and imagine what that would feel like if one of her sons was going away to war. I'll briefly go through what happens in this poem. It's quite a simple poem in terms of what goes on in it. So the speaker in this poem is a mother. And it's a mother watching her son leave to go to war. In the poem, she helps him to get ready and she's got to stop herself from getting upset. She doesn't want to let him go. So it's little things like she wants to stroke his hair and she wants to act in a really motherly, motherly way towards him. But she stops herself because she knows she's got to let him go. She's got to let him be independent. So she's sort of battling with her own emotions. She wants to mother him, but she's got to let him go. She's got to let him go and be free. When he does leave, she feels lost. She goes upstairs and she cries and then she goes out to a graveyard and in the end she's looking at a war memorial with all the soldiers' names who've died. And they're the key events of this poem. So the next thing we need to discuss is the message of the poem. What was Weir trying to say? What message was she trying to get across? And this is the message that your teachers have come up with. We think that Weir perhaps wrote the poem to give a voice to the non-combatants left behind due to conflict. Now, when I'm talking about non-combatants, I'm talking about people that were not directly involved in war, so it's people not fighting in the war. So, for example, this poem, the mother is the non-combatant. She's affected by war, but she's not in the war. So, like I said before, it's a little bit different from a normal war poem where it focuses on the soldier. This is saying, well, what about the people at home? What sort of damage happens to them? How does war affect them? And, and it gives those people a voice. So she gives the mother a voice in this poem. And we look at the effects on the people that are not directly involved in the war, but that are also affected by it. OK, so as you know, step two has got a couple of parts to it. But the first thing that you do if you're at home revising a poem is you read that poem twice. Um, for today, I'll just read it to you once, but I'll read it as clearly as I can. And then we'll move on to the second step in step two. OK, so here's the poem. Three days before Armistice Sunday and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel. Crimped petals, spasms of paper red, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding round your blazer. Sellotape bandaged round my hand, I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play it being Eskimos like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gel black thorns of your hair. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. 
I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree and this is where it has led me. Skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf gloves. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. The next part of step two is this. You will have a glossary of structural features in your pack. And what that is, is it's a, it's a sheet of paper that's basically got all the structural features or most of the key structural features that you can find in the poems in the anthology. So what I want you to do now is take a moment, have a look at these structural features and look at the poem poppies and see which ones Jane Weir has used. Just try to find one or two. And then as a challenge, try to think about why Jane Weir might have used them. What could she be trying to symbolise in the poem? Have a minute to do that first. Pick out a couple and think what they could have been used to symbolise or represent before looking at the next slide, which gives you some potential answers for that. So here are some of the structural features that you might have found. You might have found some different ones as well, and they could be right too. But I'll just talk through a couple of the structural features in poppies. First of all, you might not have noticed this, but poppies is written in what we call free verse. That means it's got no regular rhyme scheme, it's got no rhythm to it, it's called free verse, it's like it's free flowing. Now that might, may have been used by Jane Weir to create quite a chaotic tone and that could reflect the lack of control the speaker has over her son leaving or over her own identity as a mother. So she's got no control, her son's going to leave and she's also losing who she is as a mother and she can't control either. So the chaotic tone created by the free verse could symbolise that, that she's got no control, just like the poem sounds out of control. It's also got enjambment in it, and that may have been used to symbolise the lack of power and control she's got as well, and the lack of control she's got over her own identity. Because if you imagine somebody who spent their whole life being a mother, that's what they're about, and then suddenly that son is leaving, she's losing her identity and she's got no control over that. And both enjambment and free verse both make the poem sound a bit out of control. So that's reflecting her emotions, her emotions she feels out of control. She feels like she's not got the power anymore. Step three is read the additional information on the poem and answer the questions. So if you're revising poems at home using the poetry pack, there will always be a page called additional information. Now that additional information could be anything. It could be a bit of extra context. It could be something to do with language or language features that we think you need to know more about. It could even be something that happens in the poem. And the idea is that you read that information in the booklet and then there are some questions that go with it to test your knowledge of that. And sometimes those questions are about other bits of the poem as well. It's just to get you really thinking about the poem. So the additional information for poppies is this. It's a recap on what a semantic field is. Now we've done this when we looked at language paper one and it will have popped up again and again while you've been at school. But a semantic field, in case you don't remember, um, which is also known as a lexical field, so you can call them semantic fields, or you can call them lexical fields, is when a writer uses a range of words that all belong to the same topic. Now this will be easier when I show you the example. So I'm going to show you an example below, which is describing this picture of the sea. And I want you to look for words that link that all belong to a similar topic and see if you can find the semantic field. The sea sounded like a symphony written by an angry composer. The howl of the discordant wind merged with the hissing and spitting of the pure white froth. Have a little look for a minute now and see if you can spot the semantic field being used by this writer. So you're looking for words that belong to the same topic. I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, so if you have a look, I've highlighted the words in red. The C sounded like a symphony. So symphony is the first word written by an angry composer. Now, as you can see, those words are both music. They belong to the sem semantic field of music. And so does discordance. because That's when two notes go together and they don't go. They sound not very nice when they're played together. So all of those words belong to the semantic field of music. So this writer, when describing this picture, has used the semantic field of music. 
Now, when you're looking poppies, you need to look for semantic fields that Jane Weir has used. So look what she's described and then see if you can find any words that all belong to the same topic. Which semantic fields has Jane Weir used in this poem? OK, so once you've read the additional information, which we've just done, in your pack, there'll be questions that are based on the poem and on the additional information as well. So this podcast will first be used in a school session. So if you've got time now, have a go at answering these questions and then you can discuss them as a class. And if not, these are questions that you can work on at home. So use the information that you've had and um, that we've just given you and looking at the poem, have a go at answering these questions. Step four is this. You complete the theme sheet for this poem. So basically, there's a list of themes down the left hand side of this table. So power, cost, power of nature, power of man, effects of war, reality of war, identity, memory and loss. And what you need to do is try to think how this poem links to each of those themes. Now, you can see that a couple have already been filled in for you. So power, you can talk about something being powerful or powerless. So in this one, I chose to say, well, it's powerless. The mother feels powerless. She's trying to get power over her emotions, but she feels really powerless because her son's leaving. And then in effects of war, I've said it shows the damaging effects of war on the people at home. So just have a look and see if you can link each of these themes to the poem poppies. If there's one that you just think this doesn't link at all, you can put a cross there because not every theme will link. But really try to write it in, a, in the most detailed way that you can, more detailed than my examples if possible. If you've got a copy of the pack, you can complete this on the table in your pack. But if not, you can just jot down the themes on lined paper and next to them, write how they link to the poem. OK, so that's what you do for the theme sheet. Step five is to learn the top quotes and the analysis and to test yourself on them until you know them by heart. Now, in your poetry pack, the top quotes and analysis will be on a table, a table with three columns. So the quotes will be on the left hand side. In the middle, there'll be all the language features and the analysis. And on the right hand side, it will say which themes each quote links to. So when you're doing it in your pack, if you want, you could keep writing them out, writing out all the quotes and the analysis, or you could learn them with flashcards or whichever way suits you. But you've got to learn the top quotes and you need to learn the language features and the things that you could actually say about them. So I'll go through the quotes with you for this one step by step and then you can test yourself afterwards. So our first quote is this spasms of paper red disrupting a blockade of yellow buyers binding around your blazer. Now, before I start to analyse that, let me just show you what that actually means. So this is a school blazer. So, or, or it could be any blazer. He's going to, to war, isn't he? So he'd be wearing an army blazer. And if you look at that yellow strip around the outside of his lapel there, that's bias binding. So he's got something on that's got a big strip of yellow around it and she pins a poppy to it. So when it says disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding, it means that the poppy's overlapping the yellow bit. So it's disrupting it. So that's all it means on the surface. Now let's have a look at the language features. First of all, you can see the words in red are all to do with the semantic field of war. And then you think, well, why has she used the semantic field of war? She's only talking about pinning a poppy onto her son's blazer. But the semantic field of war makes us think about the son getting hurt. And it shows her fear that she can't get it out of her mind, that the son might get hurt. It's interrupting all her thoughts all the time. So it could symbolize that by way of using the semantic field of war. You could also say, if you wanted to take it even higher, you could say that by using words from the semantic field of war, we could be symbolising the conflict inside the mother. The mother's got all these conflicting emotions. You know, she wants to be a mother. She wants to let him go. It's like there's a battle inside of her. And that could be symbolised by the use of the semantic field of war. The next thing is the word blockade. If you have a look at the word blockade, it's when you block something off, you block something out. And it could be symbolising that the mother feels blocked out of her son's life. And that's the battle she's having. She feels like she's been blocked out of his life. And then the next thing you can see in the purple is there's a repeated B sound, which is alliteration. But also when it's a B or a D sound, you can call it plosives. And the plosives that make an effect like this, blah, 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 like that, and it makes you think it almost sounds like she wants to cry. So she might have used these repeated plosives to create the impression that the mother wants to cry, to show how damaged and hurt she is by her son going to war. OK, quote number two is steal the softening of my face. 
Now, what she's talking about here is somebody who wants to cry, like this lady on the picture. This is the closest that I could find. She wants to cry, but she's hardening her face to stop herself from crying. I don't know if you've ever done that, where maybe you're watching a film, but you don't want anyone to see you crying, so you make your face go as hard as possible. And that's what the mother's doing. She doesn't want the son to see her true emotions. So let's have a look at the language features. First of all, you might not even pick up on this, but it's actually personification because it sounds like the face has got a mind of its own, that the face is softening and she needs to control it. So it's like the face has got its own personality that wants to cry, but she's battling with it to stop it from crying. So she's stealing her softening face. So it's personification or you could call it a metaphor. But this is this idea of her battle, the battle going on within her, that her face wants to cry. Her true emotions are to cry, but she's battling with her true emotions and making herself not cry. So either personification or you could also say a metaphor for that. The verb stealed has connotations of something hard and impenetrable. We know what steel is. Steel is rock hard. Nothing's getting through that unless you've got a drill. I'm not even sure if drills get through it, actually. But the word steel might have been used to show that she's blocking off her true emotions. She's making them impenetrable. Nothing can get through and see the real her. She's blocked it out. So again, it shows this battle between her true emotions and what she lets the outside world and her son see. So the verb steal so that she's hardening her emotions, she's controlling them, she's making her emotions impenetrable, you can't see her true emotions. And then the sibilants, which I've highlighted, uh, steal the softening, create quite a sinister tone. And again, sound like she's about to cry, but also foreshadow the, the bad things that could happen to her son through going to war and her fear, shows her fear. This is quote three, there were four for poppies. And the quote is, I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled black thorns of your hair. Again, it was quite hard to find a picture for this, but basically what she wants to do is run her fingers through his hair. Maybe his hair is black and gelled, you know. She wants to run her fingers through his hair, but she stops herself, she resists. She doesn't do it, she can't be that sort of mother anymore. She can't treat him like a baby anymore. So let's have a look at the language features. Quite a complicated one, this one, but you can get quite a lot out of it. The word resisted and impulse juxtapose with one another. Let me explain why. When you resist something, you force yourself not to do something. OK, so when you resist something, say you want to eat something, you resist it, you force yourself not to do it. Or if you want to have a go at somebody and you stop yourself, you're resisting. You're resisting yourself, you're forcing yourself not to do something. And the word impulse is a natural reaction. So, for example, if you're straightening your hair and you put your hand on the hair straighteners, your hand will just come off. You don't leave your hand on those hair straighteners and think, this is hurting, I'll now take it off. Your natural impulse just goes, whoa, you take it back straight away. And that's an impulse. So you can see that an impulse, something that's natural to do, and the word resisted are opposites. And they could symbolise her conflicting emotions. Her natural instinct is to mother him, is to put her hand through his hair, is to look after him and protect him. But she's forcing herself to act the opposite way, to leave him. So it shows the internal battle. And it also shows that she's losing that identity as a mother. She's no longer allowed to do those things. And then, quite a complicated one again, but I really like this a lot, is the black thorns could be biblical illusion. Now that doesn't mean religious imagery, because that's just any religious word. Biblical illusion is when you're mentioning something or hinting at something from the Bible. Now, I don't know if you know about this, but the day that Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, according to the Bible, there was a crown of thorns on his head. There's a little diagram for you. And then he died on the cross after that, so he sacrificed himself for mankind. That's what Christians believe, that's what's in the Bible. So the black thorns could be alluding to this crown of thorns that Jesus wore before he sacrificed himself. Therefore, Jane Weir might have used black thorns to symbolise that she's worried that her son will sacrifice himself at war, that he'll die at war, like Jesus died on the cross. So that's what that biblical allusion could be for. But also, even if you took the biblical illusion out of it, the fact that she calls his hair thorns, we know you get hurt by thorns. So it's almost as if if she tries to mother him too much, she's going to end up being hurt. So it could symbolise that as well. So I love that quote. It takes a lot of learning to be able to articulate it properly, but it's such a fantastic quote. And I don't think many people would write about that in the GCSE. So it's really worth learning that and getting your head around it and building up your own interpretation of it. Okay, and the last quote, a split second and you were away. 
intoxicated. So it's talking about the point where she opens the door and the sun literally goes like that. It's very, very quick, a split second he'd gone. And she describes him as intoxicated. So let's have a look at what we could say about that. You've got sibilance straight away, split second, and the tone that that sibilance is creating is sinister. So again, it creates this impression that she's fearing for his life. And then the word intoxicated is the really interesting one. It's an adjective, but you wouldn't even need to say adjective, you could just say the word intoxicated. It's got connotations of being drunk. When you say someone's intoxicated, usually it means they're drunk and in danger, because if you get too drunk, you are in danger. You're not in control of your own body or mind properly, so straight away you're in danger. So he is drunk on the idea of war and freedom and going away and fighting in a war, but she knows that like anybody who's drunk, even though he's drunk on war, he's in danger. So when you're drunk, you're vulnerable. So this word intoxicated could have been used to symbolize that although he is excited and he's full of um, hope for this war and full of excitement, what, what awaits him is dangerous and she fears for him. She fears that he's vulnerable. Okay, and that's the, the last quote. Okay, so when you've learned those four top quotes, which obviously you won't be able to do instantly, you'll have to practice doing that, whether that's on flashcards or whether getting somebody to test you, or if you just keep, I like to write things out over and over again, that helps me, but it doesn't help everybody. So once you've learned those top quotes, get a copy of this table, which you've got in your poetry pack. And then what you do is don't look at the quotes at all. Don't look at the poem and write out the quotes and as much as you can remember about the language features. But don't just list the language features. Say what you could say about them as well. So don't just put metaphor. Explain what that metaphor could symbolise and fill it in as much detail as possible. And if you find that helpful, just draw your own table and keep doing it, repeatedly doing it until those quotes become something that you just remember like that that's what you do you might not have time to do that in the session in school but that's something that you can work on at home so the final step is this when you've done all the other revision give yourself a bit of time to look back through it to learn everything you need to know remember about the context remember about the language the top quotes and then take the mini quiz that's in your poetry pack okay so it'd be 10 questions on the poem answer them in as much detail as possible you can just do it on paper and then when the feedback book comes out and it's on the website you can mark your own answers and it's a really good way of deciding what you still need to revise where your areas for improvement are and it's the same for every poem that comes out revise it all really learn it understand it and then take the mini quiz without looking at anything else obviously and see where you're up to and then from that point you could say right well i don't know that much about the quote so i need to go back and do those again and decide which bits that you need to improve and then work on them. Then take the quiz again when you've forgotten it in a week. Okay, so that's, that's the final step of uh, puppies. Thanks for listening.